so excited to get to tune in with all of you. Um, some of you found the chat box on the side um, and you were able to write in where you came from. Um, so thank you to two folks who are in Alaska. Um, I am joining us, uh, joining you from Grand Teton National Park in Moose, Wyoming. Um, so I'm gonna try to share my screen with you. I have a little map pulled up. Um, there we go. So you can think about where you are in the United States or in Alaska, if you're in Alaska. Uh, the red box there, that is Wyoming. Um, so you can think about how long it might take you to get here from where you are. I know if you're in Alaska, it's probably a few days drive. Um, and if you were to fly, a pretty long flight. And then within the state of Wyoming, um, I am in the northwest corner of the state of Wyoming. So here is Wyoming. Um, Grand Teton National Park is this green blob here. And just to our north is Yellowstone National Park, which some of you have probably heard of as well. Um, so that's where I'm calling in from. And today, I know we were pretty excited to um, talk about some of the animals that we have here, um, the wildlife, some of the scenery, um, and then some careers within the national park. So if you think of questions, you can type them into the chat box um, and I can answer them. I also have some questions that Maggie sent me um, and we'll see what we, what we come up with. Um, so Grand Teton National Park was established in 1929. And then in 1943, the Jackson Hole National Monument was created. And then a couple of years later in 1950 is when those two uh, parks or parcels of land became one to form what is now Grand Teton National Park. So depending on how you look at it, we've been a park for just under 100 years, um, if you think about the 1929 date. So um, Grand Teton's been around for quite a while. Um, it is about 485 square miles. Um, the park is preserved uh, for the mountains and the scenery, the wildlife, and some of the cultural resources that were here. So we have had Native American tribes here in the Jackson Hole Valley for about 11,000 years, uh, which is quite a while. Um, and then we saw uh, explorers coming over and establishing Jackson Hole Valley um, and starting to develop it. Um, the Teton Range, which is one of the iconic things the park is uh, pr protected for, here's a photo of the Grand Teton itself in the winter time, and then another photo for you to check out. So uh, the mountain range here is 40 miles long and only about seven to nine miles wide. So it's actually a pretty small mountain range. But what makes it really unique is how it was created. Um, so the mountain range here was created by faulting. And as time went on, the mountains um, did kind of this up and down sliding motion, uh, creating a huge amount of uplift. Here's a, here's a diagram for you to see. So what that resulted in was a really dramatic relief, meaning that the distance between the valley floor and the tops of the mountains is really dramatic. It's about 7,000 feet. So for those of you who live near mountains, you can think about how tall your mountains are um, and how much relief there is uh, where you are. And I know in Alaska, I've never been there, but I know the mountains are really big there. Um, our tallest peak, the Grand Teton is 13,770 feet tall. Um, and oh, someone's in California at Sioux of the Sierra Nevada Mountains there as well. And those mountains, depending on where you are, you have a lot of foothills. And then on the east side of it, you have a really dramatic relief. And so here in Grand Teton National Park, we're on the side of the mountain range that has a really dramatic relief. And that's from that fault day. Um, here's just another diagram for you to take a look at. Um, you can see that the valley 
went down and the mountains went up, creating our mountain range. Um, the Jackson Hole Valley uh, is 55 miles long and 13 miles wide. And right now I am sitting at about 6,600 feet in elevation. So, um, and I'm at the base of our mountains behind me in the clouds um, are the, is the Grand Teton. Um, you can't see it totally today, but maybe it'll come out during some of our talk. Okay, so that is the park. Um, and again, Grand Teton it was set aside for its scenery, its wildlife, its diversity in plants and animals, and its human history. And the National Park Service um, is here to preserve and protect these natural landscapes um, and these historical places for future generations. So that means when you all start to grow up and think about maybe having kids or maybe you have grandkids at some point or you have nieces and nephews, um, these places are going to be here for all generations in the future, uh, which is one of my favorite parts about working for the park is knowing that I'm protecting these places for all of you and for future generations. Um, Grand Teton, it is winter time here. Uh, those of you who are in Alaska, if you were in the high mountain, Sierra Mountains in California, um, it could, it's also probably winter there. In Grand Teton, we see our winters lasting from about six to eight months in length. Um, and during that time, we see about 400 inches of snow in our mountains. Um, so that's about the height of a three-story building. So you can think about how tall your house is or how tall your school building is um, and picture how much snow that is. Right here where I'm sitting, we have about two feet of snow on the ground. Um, and it's pretty sunny out today and the temperature is about 30 degrees outside. So it's pretty warm. I'm sitting out here in just two jackets sometimes in the winter. It gets down to, I think our low this winter was negative 36 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which was pretty cold. I wore a lot of jackets that day. Um, but for the most part, we're kind of getting to springtime. So we're starting to see our snow melt. Um, I've noticed a lot of our birds coming back, migrating back here. Um, and the days are getting longer, the snow is melting pretty quickly, so it's definitely starting to feel like spring, but I know just looking behind me that the snow up there is still really deep and it's going to be a while before it melts out up there. In the summertime, we do see our, our snow melting from the mountains. Grand Teton has about 12 glaciers in it. Um, so we do have snow that lasts year round uh, in the form of snow fields and in the form of glaciers. Um, but we do end up having um, a lot less snow. So it does melt. In the summer, we see temperatures in the mid 80s are the highs and average is probably the high 70s uh, during the day. Um, here in Grand Teton, we have a lot of wildlife that also lives here. Um, some of our animals uh, migrate for the winter and they head other places. Um, some of our animals hibernate and they take a big long nap for the winter. Um, and then some of our animals adapt. And so I wanted to talk through a couple of my favorite animals that are here in Grand Teton that adapt in the winter time. Um, one of those animals that I really like, well, and actually, let me ask you all a question. Does anybody have any ideas, um, ways animals might adapt or change their behavior or the way they look um, in order to survive in the winter time? If you have an idea, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Or you can unmute yourself. Ooh. See somebody wrote hibernate and that's awesome. I'm um, yeah. looking for examples of adaptations. So the animals that stay here, stay awake um, and thrive in the winter. Yeah, who else has an idea? All right, I see one of you named Heather Wilson. I just unmuted you. Um, they they change their fur, like the color yeah. of the fur. 
Yeah, perfect. So let's start with that and then I'll ask for a couple more in a second. Um, yeah, so we have animals that change their fur. And um, what do you know what this is called? When animals change their fur. I see a hand. I see a hand. Another Heather Wilson. I unmuted you. Oh. There we go. Go ahead, one Heather Wilson, you're unmuted. Yeah, um, I think it's called molt. Yeah, so animals maybe molt when they're um, changing their fur, and we would we would call that camouflage when they're blending in with their surroundings. Yeah, exactly. So um, one animal that does this really well is the long-tailed weasel. Here's a picture of our long-tailed weasel. You can see that the weasel has really great camouflage because it turned white. It might even be kind of hard for you to see the weasel in this photo, but our weasel is white um, and they do that to blend in with the snow. Versus in the summertime, our weasel is brown and blends in with some of the shrubs and the soil, the plants and things that line the forest floor. So the long-tailed weasel is an awesome animal adapter. And I also have some weasel pelts that I brought with me. Um, these are weasels that died of natural causes and we now have to use for programs to show students like you. So you can see here is our white weasel. And then we have our brown weasel. Um, so you can see the color differences in there and how they might be better suited to hide from predator and prey by being white in the winter time and then brown in the summertime. Awesome, so that's one animal that changes its fur. Another one is the snowshoe hare. I bet some of you know of this animal or have this animal near where you live. But our snowshoe hair does the same thing, changes from brown um, and like a gray color to being white in the winter time, again, to blend in with the snow. Are there any other ideas of how animals might adapt or change in order to survive in the winter time? Ooh, I see somebody wrote, um, animals that live there have thicker fur. You're totally on it. One of those animals that has this adaptation are the bison. So here in Grand Teton National Park, we have bison. And our bison grow an extra thick fur coat in the winter time to stay nice and cozy warm. Um, and you can see in this photo, they're also doing something else. Maybe someone can type into the box if you see or observe what they're doing in this photo. Oh, M Mux Ox also have super thick fur. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you see that they're huddling, definitely. Um, and they're kind of walking in a single file line. Does anybody see that in this photo? So by walking in a single file line, they're able to preserve energy and only have one of the bison doing the plowing or the trail breaking. Um, so if you've ever gone snowshoeing, um, you know that it can be really hard to break trail. And so the bison, they work together as a team to uh, hike and walk through the grasslands. Um, and when they get tired, they just pull to the side let the herd go past and then get to the end of the line. And that makes their lives a lot easier. It allows them to save energy. Um, oh, some animals I see have um, three chambered stomach to help them eat moss when there is no other food. And we have an animal in Grand Teton that is similar to that. I don't know about the three chambered stomach, but I do know that our bighorn sheep is 
a really special animal to Grand Teton National Park. Um, this animal um, lives high up in the mountains all winter long and is adapted to eating the lichen on the rocks and really just laying down uh, to preserve energy. Um, in Grand Teton, we have a really special herd of bighorn sheep uh, that are one of the last genetically unaltered uh, herds here in the region. And so we're working really hard to make sure these animals have an intact habitat, meaning that we're not disrupting them in any way that would, um, that would hurt them um, or make them at risk. Um, looks like we have a question about dog sledding in Grand Teton National Park. Um, and we do not have an operation here in Grand Teton uh, through the Park Service, but we do, there are some dog sledding operations in the Jackson area. It's a good question. Okay, so we've talked about animals changing how they look. Uh, so they put on camouflage. Uh, we've talked about what animals wear, how they might change what they're wearing, like our bison. Um, and another animal that I have to show you is our otter. Our river otter also has thick fur. This animal has kind of a multi-layer system where their outer fur will help shed water while their under fur helps keep them warm. So they can be swimming in the river all winter long and can be um, hunting and surviving in the winter time. So that's another animal that changes kind of how it looks or what it's wearing. Um, and we talked about how animals change maybe what they eat to survive in the winter time um, with our, our bighorn sheep. Um, another one of my favorite animals that does this is the lynx. Um, and our lynx has a really incredible adaptation to it. It hunts mainly uh, snowshoe hares and other small rodents. But if everybody takes their hand and puts it out in front of them and squeezes your fingers together as tight as you possibly can, squeeze those fingers together, nice. Um, the lynx in the summertime has a paw that looks like this. But as the season changes, it actually grows fur in between its paws. So go ahead and spread your fingers out as wide as you can. Nice and wide. Awesome. So in the winter time, the lynx actually puts fur in between its fingers and um, creates kind of a snowshoe effect. So then it can stay on top of the snow really easily. You can see in this photo um, that lynx has really big paws for the size of its body. And this animal has adapted to putting snowshoes on so it can walk on top of the snow and more easily get, the get food to survive. Um, so that's a really incredible adaptation that that animal has. Um, and finally, um, we have another animal here that I bet some of you are familiar with. And this animal um, changes the way it looks to help it preserve energy. Um, and this animal is the moose. So our bull moose, which are the male moose, they drop their antlers uh, in early winter to help them preserve energy throughout the winter because a pair of moose antlers can weigh anywhere from 40 to 50 pounds per set, which is really heavy. That would really hurt your neck, I bet, if you had to carry some moose antlers on your head. Um, so they shed their antlers to help them preserve energy. Um, so we have some questions coming in. Thanks for the questions, love them. Um, do we have any foxes? We do have foxes here in Grand Teton. Um, we have the red fox and the gray fox. Um, and these animals are awake all winter long. I've seen a couple uh, this winter myself um, out hunting and walking around on the snow. Um, these animals, do, I think some of them tend to hunt the small animals that live underneath the snow. Um, so they're adapted to be able to dive down into the snow banks, get, get to those small critters that are living underneath the snow in the zone that we would call the subnivian zone, which is 
talking about the life zone that is underneath the snow. Um, and then, do we have any wolves? That's another great question. We do have wolves here in Grand Teton. Um, here is one of our, a picture of our wolf. Um, so we have, actually I don't know if I know how many we have. We have at least one pack of wolves here in the park. Um, I just have general numbers. Um, but it is a pretty healthy wolf population. We see them moving around the park and into the surrounding area. Uh, surrounding Grand Teton National Park, we have a lot of forest service land um, and other protected land. And so these wolves are able to move between Grand Teton and Yellowstone. Um, great. How many people visit the park each year in estimation? Um, we get about 3 million visitors a year here, majority of those visitors here in the summertime, um, but we do see a good amount in the winter. Um, some activities people like to do here in the winter uh, are snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, um, and then backcountry skiing in our mountains as well. Um, do we have wolverines. We do have wolverines. I did not bring a photo of a wolverine, but I believe um, we only have one wolverine here, and that is due to their uh, their range that they need to have. Wolverines have a really large um, territory that they maintain, and so the park's not that big, um, so I believe we only have one wolverine here. Do we have bobcats or wildcats? We do. We have both. So we have bobcats um, and we have mountain lions. So I brought my online photo to show you. Um, so these animals live here. I don't have an exact count um, of how many we have of them, but they do exist here um, in, a, in a healthy population. Okay. How many animals live in the national park? Okay. Well, there are a lot of animals that live here. I don't have the exact number, um, but I do know that we have 22 species of rodents, 17 species of carnivores, six species of hoofs, hooved animals like bison, pronghorn, uh, moose, elk, deer, we have three species of rabbits or hares, uh, six species of bats, four species of reptiles, six species of amphibians, 16 fish species, three, over 300 bird species, and then numerous invertebrates um, that we don't have an exact number for, but we do not have any venomous spiders. Um, do we have any cardio? Uh, if you could expand on what you are asking there, I will answer that question. Um, someone might come visit. Awesome. Great. Do any animals leave the park in the winter or summer? Yes. Tons of animals leave the park. Um, mostly they leave the park in the winter time. Um, Winter is a really harsh environment for a lot of animals to live in. Uh, so a lot of them will move to places where it's not as long of a winter or there's no winter. We see a lot of our bird species doing this. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, that is a lot. <laughs> what is my job? Yeah, so my job is an interpretive park ranger. Um, so what that means, and, and I do, I'm an education ranger. So I do both jobs right now in the wintertime. I'm what we call an education park ranger, which means that I get to talk to students all over the nation and um, I get to do programming and field trips. So if, if you've ever been on a field trip, um, I get to be the teacher that is on the field trip. Um, and then in the summertime, I'm an interpretive park ranger. So what that means is I get to talk to visitors. I get to help visitors have a good experience. Um, I get to um, maybe have some pelts or furs out. 
uh, for visitors to come look at if those are kid visitors or adult visitors or families, whatever that might be. Um, get to talk to them and then I get to lead hikes. I get to answer questions about the park and just help people learn and be as ready as they can be to enjoy this place. I can talk more about the other jobs in the parks too. Um, maybe I'll work through some more of the wildlife questions and then we can switch to careers in the park. Um, I see a hand up. Um, I don't know how to tell who you are, but if you want to type your question into the chat, then I'll, I'll for sure answer it for you. Um, oh, what? I heard you. The chat doesn't work. Oh, the chat doesn't work. Okay, what's your question? It's not really a question, it's a comment, but our um, trip leader was a bat biologist. Oh, a bat biologist, that's awesome. Here in Grand Teton? No, somewhere else, okay, cool. Nice, that's awesome. Yeah, so we have, we have a lot of different jobs um, here. Do we have caribou? Okay, we do not have caribou, but we have elk, uh, which are fairly similar. Um, I did not grab a photo of our elk, but we do have elk here. We have a lot of elk, and just to our south, um, we have the National Elk Refuge, um, which is run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and there are, I believe, about 5,000 elk down there right now. So they migrate from here in the mountains and they migrate just a couple miles to the south uh, for the winter time. What do the animals eat? The animals eat a wide variety of different things depending on what animal it is. Um, and we see our animals eating things, if it's a moose, they will eat like twigs and any vegetation they can find. Same with the elk. The elk eat the, um, the brush that is on the ground. Um, our deer also eat the, the vegetation they can find on the ground. Animals like the lynx, um, they'll eat the snowshoe hares or the voles and moles and the small mammals that live underneath the snow. Um, bison eat mainly plants as well. Um, wolves will hunt other small animals. So um, a wide variety of things is what our animals can eat. Do we name the animals? We do not name the animals. We do have scientists in the park that their job is to study the wildlife. So kind of like our bat biologists that we heard about. Um, we have wildlife biologists and these folks, they um, will go out and study the animals and get to know their behaviors and where they're hunting, what they're doing, how many um, babies they're having each year, um, and they'll study them, but we do not. Then we uh, occasionally will collar some of our animals. We'll put a GPS collar on them. Um, to track where they, where they are and um, watch their movement. Um, and we might go out and make field observations of those animals. Um, and we might give them a number associated with them. Um, but we, we don't ever really name them. Um, just like we don't ever um, keep them in captivity. We don't put them away at night. Like these are all wild animals that live wherever they want to. They move around how they want to as well. Do we have hawks? We do. We have all kinds of raptors um, from red tail hawks to sharp shinned hawks. Um, we have a wide variety of the raptor family here bald eagles, golden eagles, um, all of those things. How many schools have I gone to? Uh, that's the next question. For um, school visits, I've actually only done a few, but we have a number of schools that come to us in the winter time for school field trips. And so we work with mainly schools in the neighboring communities, which would be Jackson, Wyoming, Wilson, Wyoming, um, and then some schools up in Idaho. Um, so we have, um, I don't know, quite a few, probably like 20, 25 schools that come and visit us and go on a field trip with us, which is pretty amazing. Um, another question we have is, do you have any animal hospitals? 
Um, we do not. Um, we do for pets uh, in Jackson Hole. So Jackson is about 20 minutes to the south of where I'm sitting right now. Um, and there are pet hospitals. So if you have a cat or a dog or any other kind of pet, um, you can take them to the hospital. But wildlife, um, we if something happens to wildlife here, we typically let them um, figure out how they're going to survive on their own. We don't really interact. Part of the Park Service's mission is to preserve and protect. Um, but with that, we're protecting the habitats and um, watching to see how the animals interact with each other. But we um, are not interfering by giving them the cast or bringing them to the animal hospital if something's wrong with them. Um, I am not sure how many wolves we have exactly, so I can't answer that one super clearly for you. I apologize, but we have a healthy population here. Um, how bad is it to feed deer because our neighbor feeds the deer? Yeah, so it's, um, it's not encouraged to feed the deer. Um, this is for a number of reasons. Um, one is um, as animals get fed um, or have a food source that is not naturally occurring. So what I mean by that is any kind of pellets you might put out or if you put out any of like any vegetables or things like that for them, they become what we call habituated. So habituated is when these animals are no longer afraid of humans, they're not afraid um, to approach us. And animals of all types um, can carry all kinds of diseases um, that could be dangerous for humans, even if it is a deer that eats uh, vegetables and it might not seem like a scary animal, um, that animal can still carry things. And so it's important to not have them um, feed on any non-natural food source. They also can be dependent on that food source. And so once they learn that that exists, at, if someone's um, having a feeder out at a house, um, that deer is going to come back and come back and come back and it'll teach its kids to come back and to come back and to come back. Um, and that is a really negative behavior to have. And it might forget how to actually hunt for food or find its own. And then it could, it could die because of that. So um, it's best to not feed wildlife of any kind. Um, I see somebody wrote, go to a zoo um, or go to a petting zoo. And those are those are great places to see animals more closely. Um, and if there's a, a way to feed them there, that's a really good outlet for doing that. Um, do you have owls? We do have owls. Um, that falls underneath our 300 plus bird species. Um, I've I've heard and I've seen um, a couple different owls. I've seen the long-eared owl so far this year, um, as well as the great horned owl, but we have lots of different types of owls. Um, <laughs> are there any ski resorts nearby? Yes, there are. Uh, Jackson Hole Mountain Resort is uh, the kind of the biggest ski resort in the area. And then Snow King Mountain Resort is a smaller one uh, just in town in Jackson. And then Targi Resort is on the Idaho side of the Teton Mountain Range. So there are three um, ski resorts in the area. All right, I see a hand uh, from our friend whose chat is broken. So go ahead if you want to ask your question. Um, it's a comment, but our troop leader also works for um, Fish and Wildlife Service. Awesome. So you're familiar with um, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And there are many different uh, agencies that are government run that protect lands. And so we have the National Park Service that protects Park Service lands. And then our mission is to preserve and protect for future generations. So we're really focused on how to help the land stay in its most original state. Um, so that way it's here for forever. The Fish and Wildlife Service, they're also a federally run program, so run by the government, um, and their focus is more on uh, protecting fish and wildlife species. And so when they think about making decisions, they think about how it's going to affect specifically the fish and the wildlife that are using those, that land in particular. There's the Forest Service. 
uh, and the United States Forest Service, their mission and their goal is to um, see how they can use the land in the most um, sustainable and diverse way. Um, so they're looking at how to maybe log um, some of the forests in a, in a healthy way, um, or maybe they're looking at mining in a healthy way. Um, so they're, they're more protected, they're more focused on that. And then the Bureau of Land Management is other land that is here, and I hope I'm getting this mission right, but they're the land of many uses. And so they really promote using the land as recreation land and allowing folks to be on that land in many, many different ways. So each agency has its different missions, all very important um, for that. Do we have robins? We don't have robins yet. They have not migrated here. Um, is there any famous animal or event that happened or is in the park? Whew. There's a lot. Um, let's see if I can think of one that was recent. Famous animal or event that has happened in the park. Um, a couple years ago, the solar eclipse, full, the full solar eclipse happened here in Grand Teton. I was not here for it. Um, but that would have been really cool to see. Um, we also had um, glaciation here, which has helped to carve and shape the mountains in the way that they are now. Um, any famous animals? Oh, um, I know we haven't talked about the bears yet. So in Grand Teton, we have two types of bears. We have the black bear um which is an amazing bear um we love them and then we have the grizzly bear uh which is another type of bear some of you might be familiar with uh the grizzly bear is really unique to have here because there are not that many ranges in the lower 48 states where the grizzly bear still exists um so grand teton is one place um to our north up in Yellowstone has grizzly bears as well. And then Glacier National Park also has grizzly bears. Um, and then some places out in Washington, um, but that's about it. So their range is a lot smaller. Um, and then of course, Alaska has lots of grizzly bears. Um, but in the lower 48, we're really lucky to have bears here. So I'd say that's probably a famous animal we have here. Uh, what do the bears eat? Oh, someone lives in Kodiak. So you're really used to, the grizzly bears up there. Um, okay, uh, what do the bears eat? So they eat a lot of berries, um, shrubs, vegetation. Um, most of the bears are not super big hunters. Um, they're more scavengers than they are um, gonna go out and actively hunt. Um, so they'll, if they come across a carcass or if they find something that's already dead, then they'll eat those animals, but they're otherwise they're pretty much vegetarians, which I think is always so surprising. They have to eat a lot, a lot, a lot of food uh, to get ready for the winter. What's my favorite animal or bird here? Um, mm, I really love owls. Um, I had a point in my life when I was learning to be a, a park naturalist um, where I got to care for a great horned owl. And that really made me have an appreciation for that animal. Um, I got to take it for walks on my arm. We would go outside. And it was really amazing to see how that animal listened um, and could hear things in the forest that I couldn't hear. Uh, and that was really amazing. Um, so another question I have is, can you camp by the park? Um, I'm in Mendenhall Glacier National Park and so and see lots of bears. Yeah, I bet you do. That's awesome. Um, I'm jealous of all of you that live up in Alaska near all the national parks we have there. I still have yet to come visit or work up there, so maybe someday. Um, um, so can you camp at the park? Yes, we have um, quite a few campgrounds here in the park. Uh, they are all run by the park concessionaire, which means that it's a different company that runs the park the, um, campgrounds. But we do have designated campgrounds, um, and you have to camp in those designated campgrounds when you come here, unless you are going backpacking. 
Um, if you're going backpacking, then there are places you can camp in the backcountry, um, and those are also designated. Um, and so you need to get a permit, and then you can go camping in the backcountry. Um, if you think of more questions, keep them coming. I'll just talk a little bit about um, how I started working for the Park Service, and that was something that we wanted to talk about, um, my journey, and then some of the other careers that you could have in the park. Um, so I originally grew up in Wisconsin, which is in the Midwest of the lower 48, uh, right on Lake Michigan is where I grew up. And then after Call, I went to college and I studied geology. So I have a bachelor's of science in geology. Geology, just to remind you, is the study of the earth. Um, and so I studied the rocks and how the planet changes um, and why the landscape looks the way it does. And then after college, I got my first job in Glacier National Park in Montana. So I went out there um, and worked there for one season, one summer. And then I went to grad school um, in northern Minnesota, uh, again in the Midwest. And there I studied environmental education. Uh, then I went back to working in Glacier National Park for two more seasons after that. I worked as an interpretive ranger, so giving programs, talking to visitors, helping visitors plan their hikes and plan what they're going to be doing for the summer um, or during their vacation. And then I got a job in Yosemite National Park where I spent two full years living there, uh, which is in California. So my friend who's out in California, I was very close to you, um, depending on where you were, but I was in Yosemite. And there I got to coordinate a program for kids uh, in the Central Valley of California. Um, and I took them backpacking um, and did some other programs out there for two years. And then this winter in December, I moved to Grand Teton to continue working with kids and students uh, in Jackson and across the nation. So um, that, oh, someone was born in Illinois, so we are neighbors. Yeah, we were, I grew up near Milwaukee, um, just north. So I have primarily been in education and interpretation uh, during my time in the park service, but there are many different jobs you can have uh, in the park. Um, so I'll just talk through a couple of them. Um, another job you can have is um, working with our um, law enforcement and our uh, medical staff. So we have a variety of um, fire, people who work on wildfires, people who work on fires, on structures. We have folks who are law enforcement rangers and their job is to enforce the rules. Um, it's very similar to a city police officer you might find, but more focused on protecting the resource of the park that they're in. Um, so they get to help people understand um, that maybe getting too close to wildlife is not okay or um, speeding could hurt wildlife. And so helping the people understand those things. We also have medical uh, emergency professionals. And so those folks, they help respond to any kind of medical emergency someone might be having. People in the parks come here and they maybe exercise more than they're used to or aren't used to being at altitude um, or get dehydrated. And so we have folks that are set up to respond to those types of emergencies. We have scientists who come um, and their job is to study uh, what's happening in the park. So this can look in many different ways. This is a photo of an archeologist or a historic preservation worker who is um, going around the park and looking at artifacts from Native Americans or from the dude ranchers that came here. Um, maybe they're working to preserve or rehabilitate some of the historic structures here. Um, we have cabins that were built over 100 years ago. And so there's people here in the park that help to preserve and make sure that those cabins and those artifacts stay here. We have folks that work on our buildings um, and help to fix any problems that have that come up. Um, we have folks that clean our buildings. We have folks that rebuild our buildings as well. Um, we also have people who 
plow our snow. These people are so important in the winter time. With 400 inches of snow falling, um, we need folks who will come and remove the snow for us. Um, so this is an important job and in the summertime. They might help uh, clear roads if there's uh, maybe a rock fall or um, some kind of um, barricade that needs to be done. We might have those folks help us there. Um, here's another photo of our of our emergency response teams. Here in Grand Teton, we have um, a search and rescue team uh, that's called uh, Grand Teton Search and Rescue. Um, and those rangers will go up into the mountains if someone is climbing a mountain um, and gets stuck or gets injured up high in the mountains. They'll take helicopters out there. They'll take ropes um, and help rescue people who get hurt. Here's a photo of our um, trail workers. So trail workers um, are really important in helping maintain our trail systems. They use a lot of math to create useful networks of trails. Um, they also have to be really strong and use their muscles to break rocks, cut logs, build bridges, um, and create any kind of functioning pathway. Um, this job is really amazing because you learn skills that will last you a lifetime. Um, ways to get creative and use the resources you have around you, how to use tools um, and to make the park accessible for all types of visitors no matter their age, their background, their ability, um, and it also helps to reduce the impact of humans on the environment, which is really important in national parks as we have so many people visiting and walking on our paths. Having a nice path is really important. And it's, it's a very artistic job also. Um, being creative and being able to think outside the box is really important. Um, and then the last photo I have is of a wilderness ranger. And this is a ranger that goes out, um, patrols our trail systems, make sure, make sure people are using the wilderness and the backcountry appropriately. So they're out backpacking all summer long, checking in on folks who are out there. They can also respond to any kind of been in the wilderness. and information about our backcountry. In addition to that, we have a wide variety of scientists like bat biologists, bear biologists, plant biologists, people who um, are monitoring our wildlife and working to monitor our plant diversity. So um, thinking to your favorite subject in school right now or something that you're really curious about um, odds are there's a job for you in the national park service um, there are so many different things you can do here uh, that there's really really a place for everybody um so i'm going to look through what other questions came in really quick and then if we think of anything else we can finish up looks like we've got about 10 minutes to go um, so how many roads do you have going through the park? Um, Green Teton has two major roads. Um, one of those is uh, a major highway. Well, it's a two lane highway, but it's still a major highway that runs north south um, between Jackson Hole, um, the town of Jackson, and Yellowstone National Park. Um, and then also north um, up and over the mountains into some other towns. So um, there's that road. And then there's a road that runs a little bit closer to the mountain range, north south, um, that is inside the park. Um, so those are the two major roads. There are a few other minor roads in the park, but those are the major ones. Um, there is so much snow in Kodiak right now. So the deer are traveling where they were not before. Um, they are walking in the middle of the road and I saw one get hit by a car and I saw two dead deer. One was in the woods and one was on the side of the road. Yeah, that's really an interesting um, comment about what's happening and you're noticing kind of a change in how the deer are having to behave based on the weather and the climate. Um, and we're seeing that all over the place. We're seeing animals change the way that they're behaving and the way that they're adapting 
to our changing climate. Um, and that's unfortunate that they are having to walk in the road because there's just too much snow for them. They can't get around anymore. Mm, how many people visited this year? I think this year we were around that 3 million mark. Um, do you have to be really sanitary because the animals are leaving and coming back? Um, do we have to be very sanitary? Yeah, so I mean, we are not getting close to the animals. Um, and we, we definitely um, just maintain any kind of normal distance um, and sanitary precautions you would have when being around any other animals. Um, but the animals are coming and going as normal, so that's not any different. Did the coronavirus affect um, how, or like will the, how many people would visit? Um, so actually that's an interesting question. Uh, we don't know yet. Um, we do know that we shut down Grand Teton National Park. So right now we're actually closed to the public. Um, you are some of the few people that get to see the park right now. Um, so we closed the doors. Um, so that way we help uh, prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Um, and we'll be, we're really curious to see how it affects us in the coming um, months. Um, it's kind of an unknown right now, as I'm sure a lot of you are home from school and I'm sure when you're gonna get to go back, we don't really know what's gonna happen with um, our visitation this year. We might see less visitors because of the, um, of the virus. And did any of the animals get the coronavirus? You know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I don't think our wildlife are getting coronavirus um, as of now. And um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what happens, but I, I don't think any of our animals have the coronavirus. All right, are there any other questions? Lots of good comments out there, lots of mountains, yeah. All right, well, if there are no other questions, um, Maggie, is there anything else you want, want me to touch on? Um, I think that's it. Girl Scouts, can we all wave at Elizabeth to say thank you? Oh, thank you all. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. I hope that you get to come visit Grand Teton someday or you're able to find some national parks or public lands where you live and you can go out and visit those places as well. Um, especially during the winter time and during this, like go for a walk with your family, be outside for a minute. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Great, thank you everybody. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.